Well, let me start by thanking the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. What I'm going to do to tell you about some of the uh, uh, work done in our Center for Epigenetic and Metabolism at UCI. The center occupies the top floor of this building, uh, Sprague Hall. And what I'm going to tell you today is mostly the work by two uh, postdocs in the lab. Uh, two remarkable ladies. The one here is Kristin Ekelmahan, and this is uh, Lorena Aguilar Arnal. Now, this meeting has been remarkable, I have to say, and I'd like to thank the organizers because it's been very enlightening uh, for many reasons. But it's been also disappointing a little bit, uh, I have to tell you, for one little thing. This is the very first epigenetic meeting I've been where the word epigenetic has not been discussed. Uh, so what, he, what it is. In, it's like, is it semantically a good thing to, to use it? Or shall we talk about chromatin remodeling, epigenetic, whatever. But the way I will look at it is that what epigenetics is, is the interface between environment, nutrition, and where I put, where I speak, when I speak about environment, I talk about uh, also pollution, or uh, um, uh, endocrine disruptors, or uh, drug of abuse and so on, and homeostasis. And homeostasis being the critical way of how all our organisms, all the organisms are really uh, coping with normal um, life uh, functions. All physiological functions that are the basis of homeostasis are cyclic, and we wondered about how environment, nutrition, a burger, or even worse, can eventually talk to epigenetics. And what we've been finding in the past several years is that um, the circadian clock uh, contributes greatly to this connection. Um, and that's what I'm gonna tell you about today in this talk. So let me tell you historically also how we started talking in, in the lab about the circadian clock. That was 20 years ago, almost precisely. Um, and this happened by mistake. <laughs> uh, and that's why uh, it's a, a little sign of warning uh, for, uh, for everybody. Somehow, uh, this was a revelation for me. Um, almost precisely 20 years ago, a German postdoc in the lab, at the time we were working on a transcription factor called CREM, came to me and said, I wanted to look at CREM expression in the brain. It's like, oh, whatever, who cares about the brain? Right? I shouldn't say this in this audience. Anyway, he came to this picture um, that surprised me and was a remarkable expression of that transcription factor exclusively in the pineal gland. Of course, I had no idea what the pineal gland was. Um, and so I had to, to go back to books. There was no um, uh, internet at the time. So, uh, and I found that the pineal gland is this uh, iron pair structure between the two lobes in the brain, neuroendocrine, uh, uh, a little gland that is communicating between the brain and our uh, endocrine functions. It was already described by a French fellow, Rene Descartes, uh, several centuries ago, and he was talking about the center of the soul or the third eye, it wasn't too far to be right because the pineal gland is uh, embryonically deriving from endoderms, the same cells that will then make the retina. And it's become very popular these days, I mean in the past 10 years, because the pineal gland makes melatonin, this hormone that we all believe being really critical for a number of functions including eternal youth. Anyways, so uh, the German postdoc came to this picture. It's like, that's amazing. Um, I told the technician in the lab to do the experiment again while I was telling the postdoc to please go in and do a molecular analysis of what isoform of that particular gene was expressed. And the technician came with this picture. So um, that was surprising, two options. The postdoc <laughs> did the wrong experiment or the technician did the wrong experiment. In reality, no one did the wrong experiment. They both did a great experiment. And we found out that the postdoc was killing the mouse at night, and the technician was killing the mouse at daytime. This, to me, was a revelation, and, uh, and, and started a whole series of experiments in my lab, and, uh, and I got fascinated by the whole idea of cyclic gene expression and cyclic functions. Um, then we, we, went, we, went, we went on with this story and discovered, together with Solomon Snyder, that this uh, isoform creme in the pineal gland that was responsible, in fact, for the oscillation of melatonin synthesis. 20 years ago, the field looked like this. It was great. We were like roaming on the beach, swimming, getting on the top of the palm tree, look at the next island, whatever. Things have been changing in a, a slightly in the past several years, and the situations look like this now. A lot of people in the field. 
And this is because the circadian biology uh, is today something that looks like really as the, I will say the, the critical uh, systems biology approach you can imagine, the most system biology approach you can imagine, where uh, fellows from uh, the cell cycle, from metabolism, from aging, from sleep uh, research, uh, depression, uh, drug of abuse are converging into it. Now, of course, I'll tell you what the circadian clock is in a minute. Let me tell you a few things about not epigenetics, but chromatory modeling. And I'm sorry if I repeat, be a repetitious. I love to show this movie, that's why. And you don't need to see it. I mean, it's just a lot of the video, but uh, made by a friend of mine in Paris. Uh, it, it's basically show how beautiful chromatin is and how it is really organized. It's perfect for just to capture the attention of the people here. But basically, uh, we all know that DNA wraps around twice every nucleosome. And we and uh, many, many, many other fellows and friends have been attracted by these tales which have been already described by many here. Well, the question that we've been having in the lab is how is it possible to have um, a physiologically meaningful and time-specific activation or silencing of genes in this highly compacted structure? Um, and in our, in our view, the chromatin and, and the circadian clock together make a beautiful question because, as you will see in a minute, the number of genes that are controlled by the circadian clock is so high, so uh, very numerous, that the question becomes uh, remarkable. Now, those tales, we all know them really well, and it's been described here already by several speakers. We look at them conceptually as platforms with a number of possible modifications can occur, uh, and you wonder about those modifications and how they really occur. Uh, well, we all know about these enzymes, the writers and the readers, and, and the, sorry, the, the writers and the erasers. Um, and I'm not going to go through the details of that at all. The concept that I want to convey to you is that um, these enzymes need something really crucial to do their job, and that is the metabolites. You cannot add a methyl group or an acetyl group if you don't have acetyl methionine uh, or uh, acetyl CoA for these respective modifications. You need to have those metabolites around. You have to have the right amount and the right location in the nucleus, so we can talk about later if you want. Um, this is just a number of possible metabolites that um, can be considered here. I'd like to um, uh, point out one particular issue because it's been crucial for, for the next few minutes, and that has to do with acetylation. So, how acetylation looks in terms of metabolic pathways that lead to that specific uh, histone modification. Well, you have histone acetyl transferases that will add, so these are now the writers that add the acetyl group here. Uh, and in general, we think that this is uh, a confirmation of the level of chromatin that will be transcriptionally active, let's say. <clears throat> Those uh, acetyl transferases receive acetyl CoA from two possible major pathways. One is the citrate and the acetate pathway using specific enzymes. Really interesting enzymes for a number of reasons. Uh, we can talk about that also later. Um, but look at what's happening up here, where these guys <laughs> get acetyl CoA from. They get it from glucose. Uh, that's the cookies you just had before for lunch. Um, and then the pyruvate path pathway, which either through the citric acid cycle, a TCA cycle in the mitochondria, or the acetyl uh, pathway in the acetate pathway here will then lead to acetyl CoA. The reverse picture, which is the removal of those acetyl, uh, those acetyl groups from histones or even non-histone proteins, is obtained through uh, histone deacetylases. There are several classes of them. We can go and talk about them in a minute. Um, depending whether uh, you use the sirtuin pathway, the student groups of molecules um, or not, um, this deacetylation can be a modul is modulated by signaling, specifically sirtuins. Uh, activation is critically using NAD as an enzyme, as a coenzyme. And where NAD comes from, comes from, again, tryptophan, which is, again, the food you just had for lunch, uh, and the NAD salvage pathway that is really important I'll tell you about later. Now. Where all this pathway come from, all these metabolites come from? From these fellas, which I'm, I'm sure you remember by heart, 
remember from school? Super boring stuff. Uh, you know, the Krebs cycle, the urea cycle, the glycolysis, and so on. But when you do a little experiment, which is, this was done five years ago, is to go and, and take through literature all the enzymes that are known to oscillate in a circadian manner, you'll be surprised to see that, whoa, wow, it looks like a lot of this metabolic cycle seems to be circadian. So what is circadian? Circadian is, comes from the word in Latin, circadian. This is about 24 hour cycles. These are the most ancient cycles we have. They, the primates had them, uh, but also the cyanobacteria had them. <laughs> Fungi, animals, all life forms have been undergoing that 24 hour cycle, no matter what, over the past several million, million years. Um, the way we look at them is that their, their concept is, in, in terms of oscillation, is a highly conserved through species. If you go and look from a structural or even conceptual st standpoint, those cycles are high, highly conserved all the way from cyanobacteria to humans. The molecules are not necessarily the same, but some of the molecules, let's say, cryptochromes are critical for these pathways, are conserved all the way from plants to humans. Um, the most important Zeitgeber, that's a German word that means time giver, is light. That is the light dark cycle. And we all know about this, right? So uh, whoever has flown from Europe, from Japan, or is going back home to California, is going to experience that change in the light dark cycle that it contrasting your own internal clock system, which is intrinsic. It works anyway all the time. We have a clock inside that works all the time. That clock is based on a, a transcriptional translation of feedback loops. I'm going to tell you them in a minute. And the genes for the clock system is being cloned. The very first one was called period. It was cloned in the fly, and that was done by Seymour Benzer. After that, many other genes have been cloned in all possible uh, organisms. Now, where is the clock in humans? Where is the clock in mammals? Uh, and where is the central clock? The central clock is in the brain uh, and is uh, located in the hypothalamus. The light signal hits a specific neurons in the retina, they're called the ganglion cells. In the back of the retina, the light signal will travel from the, retinal, uh, from the retina all the way to the retinal hypothalamic tract, to the hypothalamus, to this group of neurons, that about 20,000 neurons in the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. These neurons are really remarkable. What they do is to oscillate with a 24-hour cycle, no matter what. You can take them away from the mouse, or a rat and put them in a, in a culture dish and they will oscillate with 24 hour cycle for months. They don't require anything else in the light. The only thing that does is to readjust them every day. Otherwise they will shift. That's how season are actually red. That's how changes in the light dark cycle are red. That's how I have a jet lag right now. Then a big discovery came to the field that clocks are really everywhere. This was done maybe 15 years ago by a number of groups. So the SCN here in the hypothalamus, I told you, is a central clock. Is we believe today's an orchestra director of the whole system, uh, and receive the light signal from the light hypothalamic tract. But then the SCN connects to peripheral clocks: the liver, the heart, the spleen, every cell in our body, in the skin, no hair, whatever. All that is in train in this perfectly synchronized as a whole system that oscillates to a 24 hour cycle. You can change this regulation by doing motorial activity or even restricted feeding, which is basically you eat only 10 minutes a day, try to do that with your mouse or yourself. And if you only have 10 minutes to eat, trust me, you're gonna go eat, even if it's in the middle of the night. And that will re-entrain your peripheral clocks independently from the central clocks. It's a way to uncouple the system. Otherwise, the system is perfectly synchronized. Now, what happens when you disrupt the clock? Well, we disrupt the clock, and this is studies done in a number of ways. You have lots of possible pathologies. Of course, insomnia, because the sleep-wake cycle is directly related to the circadian system. But depression, mental disorders, inflammation, Accelerated aging, there are several things that we can talk about this here. Obesity and diabetes, even several forms of cancer have been shown to be uh, uh, being way higher than uh, if you have a disruptive clock system. 
when you disrupt the clock? Well, when you respond to that third reviewer <laughs> at 2 in the morning, <laughs> and you try to tell him that he was wrong, but, um, or whether you look at Facebook or you watch TV at the wrong time of day. Well, as I said before, we have evolved over a million years to be entrained by the light dark cycle based on the sun. But this is only what happened in 50 years, only in the United States. We have increased, especially with look down here in California, our exposure to light something like 250 times in respect to the normal level. That has changed our normal way to um, uh, cope with the light dark cycle that is natural. So we've been stressing our body dramatically in the past 50 years. Another way to stress our body, to stress the clock, is food. It's not just important what you eat or how much you eat, it's also important when you do that. Great experiment that defines also the epigenetic basis of what I'm telling you about. Uh, this is a study done in Israel, but this has been repeated by a number of colleagues and also in our lab. You can take mice and feed them the same diet, and these mice have the exactly the same genotype. Same number of calories and type of calories. But this fellow here is fed at the right time of day. This fellow here is fed at the wrong time of day. So you just get fat if you have a burger at 1 in the morning. You can have it at midday if you really care about it. But if you want to have it at 1 in the morning, that's not good. And of course, this has been uh, confirmed by a number of studies. You can go and see this. No counts for all the clock genes that have been done. And all those genes, all those mutant mice have uh, metabolic disruption, metabolic phenotypes. So there's a very strong link between the circadian machinery and the normal circadian physiology in our metabolism. How is that possible? It's possible because the clock controls genes that are really important. How it does it? It does it through a, a transcription machinery is shown here. You got the good guys, clock and beam out, and the bad guys. Per and cry, these are repressors, clock and beam activators. Now, for simplicity, they will fuse together and you will see transcription occurring from the activators. There you go, clock and beam will transcribe the repressors, and you have now the proteins made in the, in, uh, after translation, uh, and you have several levels of complexity. Now, first thing to note this is daytime, the sun. The repressors are made, they're migrating to the nucleus, they're dimerized. Several level of complexity, transcription, translation, dimerization. And then by the time all the repressors are in the nucleus, right here, it's nighttime. It's the moon here, right? So at this point, these repressor will shut off their own expression. And there's another level of complexity is the proteasome activation that destroys the repressors. There are F-box proteins specialized for the clock system. And there you go. When all the repressors are gone, the transcription can start again here and here and it's daytime again. This is exactly what happens every 24 hours in every cell in our body. Now, how much of our genome is controlled by this system? Lots. Something like at least 15% of the transcripts are transcribed that way. And you can see now, RA has been done in a number of laboratories. This is specifically an experiment done in my lab on the liver. This I told you that gave it time, different times of circadian cycle. You see these blocks of genes oscillating, thousand genes here. We're talking about in the liver, normally you will have something like 2,000, 2,500 genes oscillating beautifully, and you can see them oscillating at different peaks along the circadian cycle. Now, we thought that in order to have these oscillations, these beautiful changes, chromatin had to be also modulated in this cyclic harmonic way. And um, when you go and look with that specific K9, K14 antibody on H3 tail, you can see the acetylation on a specific promoter. Uh, one of these genes, called DBP, is also beautifully oscillating. This was done several years ago. Mazao Doi, a great postdoc in the lab, found one thing that opened the, the, the lock to the, to the black box of the chromatin system in, in the circadian field. And this was a very simple discovery. The discovery was the clock protein. I told you being a transcription activator is also a writer. What Mazao found is that clock as a transcription activator contains a histone acetyltransferase activity and is able to add those acetyl groups. After this first um, hint in this first crucial handle to the system, additional people came to the lab and started to question 
how the system really will work. And one of the questions was, if there is a, a writer in that clock, what will be the eraser? And another Japanese bookstore, another great guy, uh, Yasu Nakahata, decided to explore this, this, this question. Of course, they had, the, had the, uh, uh, plenty of options from all the possible HDACs as the possible erasers. Uh, is like tension for a number of reasons. I don't have the time to tell you now. Was attracted by this class, the SIRT1, the class three of HDACs. And in fact, he found that SIRT1 was an eraser uh, for the clock system. What is SIRT1? Many of you will know that is an HDAC that has a number of crucial uh, 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 features that I'm going to tell you in a second. Well, is one HDAC that is functioning only when NAD is around. So if there is, if there is no input from the cell in terms of energy metabolism, this HDAC is not going to work. Um, so SIRT1 uses NAD, consumes NAD, and will um, remove the acetyl groups from an acetyl protein, whether it's a histone or a non-histone protein. And from NAD, will make nicotinamide, creating thereby a deacetyl protein. So this protein, this CERT1, links protein acetylation to metabolism directly because it uses NAD, thereby changes in metabolism, will change the acetylation of a possible uh, uh, substrate, and links aging to and diet to metabolism because one way to activate sirtuins, uh, all the group of sirtuins, is caloric restriction. Less you eat, more you have activation of sirtuins. That means you have more NAD in the cell, and you have more nicotinamide formed, um, and you have thereby a number of positive functions, of positive features for your physiology. And these are um, very briefly um, uh, shown here. This all work by uh, uh, colleagues, Fred Alt, Lenny Guaranti, David Sinclair, and so many others in the sirtuin field. Um, basically, a large number of substrates have been found that are deacetylated that is, that by the sirtuins, uh, and they, they will lead to control of uh, uh, insulin secretion, mitochondrial biogenesis, adipose tissue, and adipogenesis, and so on, uh, inflammation, and, and so on. Now, I'm not going to go through all this, but just to make sure you realize that sirtuins were found at the time to be uh, important for a number of functions. And thereby, we went into that direction uh, very much. And we found the following summary <laughs> of the situation as it was until, uh, I, I will say, a couple years ago. Basically, we feel that there are uh, two possibilities in the situation between these two oscillates depending on the signaling and metabolism system. There's a complex where uh, there's a positive <coughs> complex for transcriptional active sites, clock and beam out, the two guys I showed you before, which have hat activity as clock does, also bind additional hats, and it binds also methyl transferases such as MLL1, and we found <coughs> MLL1 being required for uh, the recruiting of clock and beam out to chromatin. And then there is an oscillation that goes towards the other side where sirtuins, but also other HDACs and dimethyl transferase will allow transcriptional silencing or let's say shut off the transcription. And this will be directly reading NAD in the case of sirtuins. Now, uh, of course, the situation is always more complicated than this. And we know today there, there are several other possible um, uh, chromatin remodelers in play. But I don't have the time to go through that. So I'm going to tell you very quickly two stories. Um, and the first one was started by one observation, again, made by uh, Yasu Nakahata that is shown in this next slide. What Yasu wondered about is if CERT1 is so important in deacetylating sites on chromatin in response to um, a cyclic circadian event, is it possible that CERT1 itself is circadian because the, end, the coenzyme is circadian? Um, and that's uh, what made us interested in this, in, in this information. So NAD is made by tryptophan, as I told you before, but also through the NAD salvage pathway, a pathway that is conserved all the way from yeast to mammalian cells. And NAD um, is critical in this pathway in order to uh, have NAD made continuously, you need uh, proteins, enzymes, which consume NAD, CERT1, but also 
uh, PARPs uh, and so many others. Then NAD will be transformed into nicotinamid. In order to get back to NAD, you need a bunch of enzymes, the critical one being this one called nicotinamide phosphorobasal transferase. So in a number of studies, I don't have the time to tell you today, what we found is the following, is that NAD as a coenzyme, as a metabolite, oscillates itself. And the reason why it's oscillating is because the rate-limiting step in that NAD salvage pathway is NMTP. And MTP itself as a gene, as a, as, a, as a protein, is oscillating. Why NMTP is oscillating is because the gene NMTP is controlled by the clock system. It's one of those clock control genes and is under control of clock and BMAL and so on. So what really happens, we link the transcriptional feedback loop to an enzymatic feedback loop through NAD that is now feeding back also the system here. This further number of observations that I'm not going to have time to tell you today, but I, they will be, this is the key to the next step of uh, uh, research done in the lab. And the question we had in the lab is if NAD is oscillating, how many other metabolites are oscillating? I'm not going to tell you the details. Don't worry, it's a lot of work. But the picture looks like this. So we're not going to go through that. But we found a lot of metabolites oscillating in the liver. And you can go and look at this particular uh, uh, resource. is a website. And the web resource is available to everybody. You can go connect to this circadiomics and check whether your favorite metabolite or your favorite gene is oscillating in all the possible tissues you like. Now, the summary of this is the following. We did the circadian metabolome in the liver by looking at about 600 molecules by mass spec. When you do that, you can see that different groups of metabolites oscillate with different timing in the liver, in a normal liver. And this was a really important information. 50% of our metabolites are oscillating in the liver every day, all the time, under normal metabolic conditions. So the question that Kristen uh, ekel had in the lab was, what about if we challenge the system? What about if we now start to challenge the system, let's say, by nutrition, which is what we do every day? So she designed this experiment. She took mice and fed them either a normal chow or a high-fat diet. And this was done over 10 weeks. It is a classical paradigm for a high-fat diet experiment. At the end of the 10 weeks, the last day, she collected the liver from these mice at different times circadian cycle in the liver. Now, in reality, she collected many other tissues, but I'm going to tell you only the story of the liver. And then she did the transcriptome and metabolome analysis from this livers, either normal or challenged by high fat diet. And what she found was that there is a reprogramming of the circadian clock by nutritional challenge. This reprogramming is epigenetic and metabolic. Now, this is what happens to the normal metabolism of those 600 metabolites I told you before. It's a normal child is now in high fat diet. I'm not going to go and explain this. It's pretty visual. You will see that every single group of metabolites now start to act differently under high fat diet. So basically what happens is that you eat your burger. That's what happens to your liver. Now we can go and look at specific metabolites. I'm not going to go through all of them, but two um, in that I think are really interesting. Now you can do heat maps with metabolites as well as you can do with genes, of course. Is now a map of number of metabolites in the liver and normal chow and high fat diet. You can see that the normal oscillations of these metabolites are disrupted here. Which ones are disrupted and which one I'm going to tell you about? Well, one is the NAD. I told you NAD oscillates normally in the liver or in many other cells. Actually, it oscillates in neurons, it oscillates in fibroblasts. Now, that oscillation, that's the green line, is gone in high fat diet. So now you think about sirtuins. PARPs, all those enzymes are requiring NAD as a coenzyme are not working the same normal way. They're not, I will say, homeostatic anymore. That NAD level is flat. Uracil, a critical metabolite in the nucleic acid synthesis, which has a beautiful oscillation in the liver, that oscillation is dramatically impaired. So how that works? It works this way. I told you that 
And it is made through the NAD salvage pathway. The key enzyme is an NMTP that is regulated directly transcriptionally by clock and beam out. That oscillation is very present in normal chow, but the transcriptional oscillation of NMTP is gone now in IFAC diet. What happens in new PP2? Is that is the key enzyme to make uracil, same thing. The PPT is nicely oscillating in normal chow, it's not almost flat in IFAC diet. Why this happens? It happens because there's no more binding on clock and beam out. Chromatin recruiting of the clock and beam out complex is impaired by IFAC diet. And this also is directly related to the fact that there is no more acetylation on the K9, K14. There's no more K3, uh, sorry, H3, K4, 3 methylation. So there is a dramatic reprogramming that blocks the oscillation of those genes. Now, we can go and look at what happens to a thousand genes, not only those two, and this is where it happens. There's a normal oscillation in I5, in normal chow. You have a thousand genes are now are not oscillating anymore. There's a total reprogramming of a huge chunk of the genome. But this disruption of oscillation, and this was a surprise for us, is accompanied by another thing that we didn't expect. While a thousand genes that are normally oscillating are disrupted, another thousand genes, which normally will not be oscillating, they start to oscillate. So basically that tells you that when you eat high fat diet for 10 weeks, it's not that you don't have a clock anymore, you just have a different clock. What is this different clock? All these genes are not clock BMAL dependent, don't have e-boxes. They are dependent on other transcription factors or de novo oscillating pathways. And what are those genes? I can tell you, you can, can go and see the paper about the inflammasome, heat shock response, you name it. I'll pick only two for you, PCX and Cydex, two really cool uh, genes for a number of reasons. Uh, this is um, a, a fat-specific protein, uh, is a marker for cell death, and these are uh, key enzyme in the period pathway. Why those two? Well, because those two are controlled by a friend, PPAR gamma, um, that is a transcription factor that is directly responsive to inflammation, uh, and has been described by a number of fellows, Bruce Spiegelman, Ron Evans, and so many others. Uh, so this pathway is really well known, and we found that when you go and look uh, those genes have now become oscillatory. About 50% of them are PPAR gamma targets. Others are SRBP targets. Some other are CREB targets. But you can say that there are no E-box targets. So there's a reprogramming of those genes. They've now become oscillatory. How do they, they do that? So let's look at the PPAR gamma picture. PPAR gamma normally is not oscillating. Now if I diet, the proteins start to oscillate not only by the recruiting to chromatin of PPAR gamma, the normal chow is flat, becomes cyclic in IFA diet. So what happens is IFA diet tells the protein now to bind to chromatin in a cyclic manner. What is the result of that? The result, the result is Cydex as expression. It's flat, the black line is flat in normal chow, becomes oscillatory in IFA diet. And this is true also for other, the other gene, PCX. Uh, and the binding of PPAR gamma, as well as acetylation of H9 in, and K9 and K14 is now oscillating. So what is the picture here? We have two situations. High fat diet does two things. Provokes a loss of oscillation for about 1,000 genes. And this is due to the fact that clock can beam out that will normally bind the promoter and activate transcriptionally a promoter in a cyclic manner they cannot bind the promoter anymore. There is no chromatin recruiting. That promoter, let's say an MTP, results in flat NAD level. But then there's also gain of oscillation for another group of genes. For example, PPAR gamma, that is normally flat, becomes cyclic. And that cyclic oscillation of the transcription factor brings the activation of a specific gene. I picked this one in specifically for a reason, because this is a, a key enzyme in the methionine pathway for the synthesis of Saha, and thereby critical also for additional and possible cascade of events in terms of uh, um, uh, epigenetic regulation. The summary of this 
is the following, is that, and I, that's what I wanted to tell you also, is that this reprogramming is nutrition driven, is not linked to obesity. You have that reprogramming only within three days of IFA diet, not 10 weeks, three days. And it is reversible, that's good news. That is, you can have 10 weeks of IFA diet, you get fat, you get diabetic, but you can go back, you don't get thin within three days. But if you go back to a normal chow, at least you get the reprogramming plastically reversible, and that's really good news. Another um, take home message is that this tells you that the circadian epigenome is much larger than what we thought. We thought it would be only 10 to 15% of the genes. That's true, but it's also not true. It means also that depending on the uh, metabolic and epigenetic landscape, the number of genes that become oscillatory can be much larger. In the last very few minutes, I'm gonna tell you one little story that, uh, which actually is not little, but it's a story that I like a lot. I gotta tell you about this. And this brings me to, um, let me see if I have a picture here. Yes, uh, okay. Uh, this brings me to a, to a question which is, I told you there are blocks of genes that are activated at different times, right? So that there are thousand genes oscillating in the liver, let's say, but if you go and divide the different groups by time along the circadian cycle, you'll see there are groups of genes that move together. This brought us to under, try to understand whether there will be a, a logic there that is not just transcriptional, like transcription factors going to those genes and tell them, go, right? And um, here I'd like to uh, pay tribute to this particular paper by um, uh, Thomas Kramer that I'm sure all of you know, but I think this was, at least for, for my perception, uh, 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 it really um, a changing, changed my mind dramatically about how the nucleus organized. What basically it was, it was said in this paper about 10 years ago is that chromosomes are in specific location in the nucleus. They're, and their that was location is predetermined. And, and when the two cells divide, they, they'll go back to the same position. <laughs> Right? Um, this was to me uh, revealing and uh, brought me to question whether it's possible that the circadian genes will be uh, present or at least connected to each other uh, and that connection might be related to their activation or silencing. So we went on to collaborate with Gordon Hager um, and the question we had that was worked by Lorena is, is the circadian epigenome organized in nuclear territories? And I'm sure all of you have been heard, you know, talking about territories. And, but the question being, is it possible there are hubs where uh, those genes that are co-regulated together, let's say they are activated at one time, and then they're decreasing in expression at the same time, they will be physically touching each other. Are those in the hubs? Um, and those hubs might be related for a reason. So we went on to do uh, 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 4C analysis, which I'm sure is known to most of you, is a way where um, is a system, is a technology by which you take a specific piece of DNA, a gene of your, um, you know, your uh, like, and uh, connect, see if it connects physically to other genes, other pieces of DNA in the whole genome. Uh, in this derivation of the 3C analysis, where you will take two genes that you choose to start with. All right, so we've done the 4C analysis along the circadian cycle, um, and uh, we choose several times. We choose a peak of expression. This is, again, the DBP gene, which oscillates beautifully, first peak, second peak. And we took the first peak right here and the second, plus three additional time points at the trough. We also took cells where the clock is knocked out by a mutation of a key uh, molecule, a BMAL, and we took a time at the trough, a time at the peak. So these are our uh, controls. And you can see that uh, we found a DB interactome. Uh, in, in, in those in, that interactome showed a number of possible connections. Some other uh, circadian, those are about 23 of them, uh, interesting number. Uh, permanent, which is 13, those are there all the time. They don't change over time. And then a number of uh, other uh, spurious interactions. Where are those interactions? Well, DBP is on the chromosome seven. You can see this by circus plot. And you can see those oscillation, those, sorry, those connections 
are specific chromosomes here and here, while other chromosomes, 13, 14, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and so on, are not really connected. So these interactions exist, and they seem to be very specific. Now, what happens to those interactions? What you do here, you measure the frequency of connection, the frequency of, of touching. And if you go at CT22, this now circadian time 22, one of the peaks, you see all these green arrows. That means those are positive interactions. That means like pieces of DNA, they touch each other on the different chromosomes shown here. Those now, as you can see, will disappear right here at the trough, CT34. All those connections are gone. And then they come back at the second peak, CT46. The same connections come back. So this tells you that these connections exist and they're following the time of expression of the gene, right? So the gene peaks here and then peaks again. The connections are present at two peaks but are gone at the trough. Are these connections clock driven? There are. You use now the BMAL knockout and those connections are gone whether you look at the trough or at the peak. So the clock system, the clock molecules are required to establish those physical interactions, DNA, DNA in the nucleus. Are those real? Of course they're real. Without a fish analysis, this is just one example between DBP and another gene of chromosome 10. Uh, and the two <coughs> genes are shown here merging. But if you go and measure those, those uh, connections, you can see those connections in black and the wild type cells are beautifully circadian. There's different circadian time. While in the knockout are gone, both peak and trough. What are those genes? What are those connections? Of course, we don't the arrays. Uh, and you can look at this if you want, but the, the key issue is the following. All the genes we found that are physically interacting with DBP, with our bait, are co-regulated with the same timing. So the genes that are physically together in what we call a circadian interactome are actually transcribed in a coordinated manner, as shown here. Now, some of you might be interested in reading this, but if you want, if you can read it, you also find that some of the genes are connected to our circadian bait are additional chromatin remodelers, and that to us is very intriguing, of course. So the picture we have is the following. There is really a continuum in this uh, association in this assembly of the interactome. Uh, when it's active, we know it contains the clock machinery because when you knock out BMAL, this interactome is not there anymore. But otherwise, you go from an interactive phase, so the interactome is intact, and that's where transcription is high, and then you go to an intermediate state to a place where instead there is no transcription, or transcription is very low, and there is a, the, the, this this interactome is now disassembled. So we believe that um, in reality there will be several interactomes uh, depending on what type of gene you're looking at. Now, our interest is also to understand how specific metabolism, nutrition, NAD in particular, will probably act on the interactome along the circadian time. I finished, I was pretty much on time. I'd like to thank the people in the lab. This is not the lab, but it's not so far from it. It's only five minutes away. This is Crystal Cove. Uh, it's a, a beautiful state park between Laguna Beach and Newport Beach. I'd like to thank everybody in the lab, really, but I told you the work by Kristen and Lorena right here. Thank you so much.